first of all, I'm gonna talk, we're gonna talk about how to build a horror scenario, and we're gonna build one together, but initially I'm gonna talk a little bit about ways to make um, a, a horror scenario better, more believable, more fun for your players, okay? And I'm assuming here that y'all are playing uh, uh, d and or Pathfinder or some fantasy system. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanna play, uh, if you're a Call of Cthulhu player, uh, obviously I love you. There's information in that already. Plus I have a video online last year when I did the same stem on our book for Call of Cthulhu. So, there is a author whose name is M.R. James. It's not Mr. James, it's Montague Rhodes. And he is H.P. Lovecraft's favorite ghost story writer. He wrote amazing ghost stories with skinny, bony, physical ghosts that are just um, fabulous. And some of them have been made into short films by the BBC or elsewhere, but they're terrific. Actually, one's made into a movie. If you've ever seen the movie, um, uh, what's the name of the movie? The, the one that's based on... Uh, um, Where the guy says that the devil's trying to get him, he won't believe it. Oh, Cur Night of the Demon. Curse of the Demon. Curse Night of the, of the Demon. Demon. Yeah. That's the M.R. James story. But regardless, Lovecraft loves him. And to his credit, M.R. James wrote an essay about how to write a scary story. Now he's going ghost stories and he has three rules. And these three rules usefully function for role-playing games. So one of the rules is The monster must be malign. There's a lot of ghost stories in the day where the ghost really all it all wanted was for you to find his body or tell you where the treasure was or something dumb, clear his name. And the emergency says, no, the monster's got to be evil. Okay? Now, if you're playing Call of Cthulhu, it's not a problem. In D&D, you can probably find someone who's blind enough, but you don't want an enemy who's just there who isn't really bad because then... Once the players find out it's bad, even though it was scary earlier, they're kind of like, oh, it, it's not bad, I guess. It kind of removes the fear you had early on in the show or the, or the thing. So the guy's got to be blind. He doesn't have, that doesn't mean he, have, he, has, he must want to kill every single person in the world. He might only be blind because he must exterminate the Johansson family line or, he, or whatever it is he wants. It's okay to have, have a, a focused malignity, but it's got to be a bad guy. Don't be tempted to say, oh, the arch lich is just misunderstood. You know, he really all he wanted was to raise pop. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm not of exaggeration, but, I, but we've all seen people do it. To have an evil villain that isn't actually evil. Uh, one interesting way of doing it, if, if any, has anyone seen the movie Blackula? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in the movie Blackula, Blackula is kind of a tragic figure, right? He didn't want to be a vampire. I mean, Dracula does it because Dracula is a huge, colossal prick and turns him into a vampire. And he comes out and he's kind of, and he, and he falls in love with a girl and black and starts. But the fact is, in Blackula, he's got to be destroyed. He's spreading vampires everywhere and getting more and more of them. He's killing people. And he, and he may not mean to be a bad guy. But boy, is he malign, right? If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. And it's also the act, I mean, it's a terrible name, right? But the actor is William Marshall, who's this great Shakespearean actor, and has a wonderful voice. I mean, it's like Christopher Lee level voice. So uh, it's, it's a lot better than you expect from a movie called Black Hill. Um, so he's got a, a guy who is misunderstood and has a tragic backstory and all that, but he is evil and his existence makes there be more evil. And the vampires are spreading like zombies in Blackula, you know? And in the final battle scene, he's killing cops left and right. Anyway, so monsters malign. Got it? Good. Rule number two. Don't use jargon. Now, M.R. James, of course, meant don't talk about like vibrations or past lives or something. But in gaming terms, one of the things that we all have going for us is that we are using a game and games have rules. And I know there's games that are trying to be system or isolates or whatever, but the, but the point of the rules is so you can answer questions in the game, like where is the elephant? Um, who is nearest to the glass window? You know, you, there's, there's, there's a reason for the rules that they serve a purpose, okay? But what you don't want people to do is be focused on the rules instead of on what's happening. So for example, if the monster is attacking, 
in, you can not usually do this. The players know the rules. You put it at the back. You can say instead of saying the monster rolls a seventeen and he hits you for ch 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 uh, seven damage, you would say you would just roll your attack and say the monster swipes at you. And then you roll the damage. He says he rips open your shoulder, take seven points. Then the focus is on the injured shoulder not on the fact it was seven points, then later on in the adventure, maybe he's doing something, he fails some roll or something, and say, oh, it must be because your shoulder was hurt. And he goes, oh yeah, that makes sense. And he's thinking about the injury, okay, instead of about the rules. What, what, what you know, so focus on the, what's the rules are trying to, the rules are trying to represent something in the real world. Well, you have to use the rules to say, you need to tell the guy he's got seven points of damage, but focus on the real world event first, and then, go in with the uh, and what it means in game terms. So they're thinking about the real world. And like I said, it's okay for that real world event to have other effects. Like you can say, well, you know you're gonna climb that ladder slower because the monster tore open your shoulder. And the player, a reasonable player, which hopefully you all have, will go, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I'll, uh, you know, maybe I'll try something, you know, and you get your ideas, okay? So don't use jargon. In, the, in, this, in this case, it's game jargon. The monster doesn't drain an energy level. A life, the monster, its enervating touch sucks your part of your soul out and you lost a life level, right? First is the, the effect, second is the rules, okay? Sandy, can I ask a question? Yes. So when M.R. James wrote this, there was no D&D. &D. What was he, the he jargon was he was worried about, yeah? Madame Blavatsky, like vibrations and past lives and sensing auras. And, and like, uh, like new, I mean, sadly, it's, he's writing this in 1925, and yet the new age stuff is exactly the same now. I'm not saying new age is bad, I'm saying it's not good in a, a ghost story, okay? You bring in the medium to detect the ghost, can be effective if the medium gets his butt kicked, okay, or is destroyed or something. It's not effective if the medium contacts the ghost and finds it, oh, it just wants you to find his money. Okay, so that's what he was doing. <laughs> Okay, uh, the movie um, uh, City of the Walking Dead by Lucio Fulci has an especially effective uh, mediumistic sequence, I feel. Uh, um, it's, it takes place in Dunwich, actually, and uh, there's a, there's, they, they have a seance, and it is a, uh, a hair razor. I mean, there's maggots flying through the windows, and there are people dying. And Okay, so third rule. Set your adventure... in a place where your readers can reasonably imagine themselves to be. Okay, let me give you an example. Probably most of you have seen the movie Alien. Okay, now Alien is aboard a spaceship where a few of us will ever be. But this spaceship is dingy and there's condensing water and there's chains hanging and it's like this rundown tramp ship and the people aboard it seem like real people they're bitching about their pay they're like they're, they're doing things that seems like man if i was on a spaceship this is the kind of spaceship i'd be stuck with and so it seems like a real place it comes alive for them imagine instead you had the same story of alien but it was aboard the starship enterprise none of us are going to be on that ship Everything's plastic and clean and works and it's really nice. It doesn't seem like it's a fun place. I love Star Trek, but it's it's a terrible place for a horror adventure because it doesn't it doesn't seem like a place you you can't really put yourself there. But I could be on aliens, Nostromo. Okay? And even though they're both spaceships, it seems more prosaic. Um, I when I played Call of Cthulhu, I said it in the modern era, not the 1920s. Because, I, because it's easier for my players to put themselves in the modern era. If you're playing a fantasy world, then you have the challenge of making that fantasy world seem, frankly, less fantastical when you're doing a horror adventure. Make it seem more like a real place. You know, there's, there, and, and we'll get into some ways of doing that, but if the players are already used to your, your campaign, used to your world, used to your thing, and it's kind of settled into their bones, they know how it all is, then they will feel 
more like it's a prosaic place. And you guys running D&D or Pathfinder or whatever have a big advantage over the guys running Call of Cthulhu because the guys playing Call of Cthulhu know they're going in for a horror experience and your guys don't. So when you spring something terrifying on them, it's going to be come out of left field and that's really good and they'll be used to the regular world they live in here's where we are we're down here in Lankmar or whatever city, city of the judges overlord whatever it is and then suddenly something really terrifying happens that's good but you want to play down the fantastical play up the prosaic and then bring in the horror okay that's Amar James taking now here's one way of playing up that and here's a rule that is not from Amar James that I use I talk more about these in a video called Three Rules to Make Your Horror Role-Playing Better. And this is another video I have called One Rule to Make Your Horror Role-Playing Better. <laughs> and this is... Okay, now you can say... <clears throat> the sarcophagus falls open and the mummy comes out. And that is visual. They get a visual image of a mummy coming out of a sarcophagus but we can make this more real. We can say the, far, the, far, the sarcophagus clangs open or thuds open and it, and it scrapes out. Now they're getting a sound in their head, not just an image. You could add smell, right? The air, the, the, the air fills with, with bitter spices. Like a monk, right? you can okay, and you can have more than the air grows chill. You can taste bitterness in the air. You can use all the senses, okay. Now you don't really have to. What I have found is that three senses is kind of a magic number, and at that point the thing feels pretty real to the players if you're using three senses. I mean, sight is kind of a gimmick, but you don't even have to use sight. You can just say, the air grows chill, the thumping of your heart starts, your pounds in your ears, um, uh, the, uh, you know, a dull ache goes across your head, because temperature and um, pain are different senses. And they, and they seem different, different in people's minds. So, you know, the, the, the uh, an acrid taste is, right? or sickly sweet, and sickly sweet could either be sound, smell, or t but you see what I'm saying. Use senses, the more senses you use your old. Now, I'm not saying you should read off a paragraph or description whenever a monster comes, but when there's something you want to be memorable to have the players sit up and take note of, increase the number of senses beyond one. Because the, the, the lazy GM will use just sight, but if you use more, you know, and a lot of times for a horror thing especially, you don't want to lead with sight. You want to say there's heavy dragging footsteps in the corridor, and then they're like, Oh, you know, this bad pounding on the door resonates through your bones. Now you got sound and feel. You get the idea? And then when they finally see the thing, you don't even have to describe it very much. And of course, we all know the over description of a scary thing sometimes isn't effective. I mean, sometimes it works. Like, I think that Cthulhu is pretty great on the image we gave you. Plus, if you look at it, it's actually a fantasy Cthulhu. Because look at the, look at the adventurers in the front. See them? They have a sword and stuff. And they just learned that, they're, that all is lost because they didn't think Cthulhu was going to be so big. But... Uh, and there's an eclipse of the moon, which makes it, like, why is that happening? There's nothing good about an eclipse of the moon when Cthulhu's showing up. Um, <laughs> so, there's some rules. <coughs> Monster must be blind. Don't use game jargon. Set your adventure as prosaically as possible. So, not on the moon. Not in the, the lost land where wishes come true. Right? Not Somewhere seems more ordinary. And... Uh, and if you're like, if you haven't crawled into a dungeon, have it be the most prosaic dungeon until the things come, right? And then you have use three, which I, I, yeah, that was awesome. Use three senses. The way I wrote it was the best way ever. And I don't have a eraser. Yes, you do. I say I don't. You do. I should know. I'm gonna erase this. I'm not gonna erase that. That's awesome. I want you all to go to my website and see my stuff. Website that earns zero money for me, it's only for your benefit. Also, on the website, there's a the thing about why I don't play in the 1920s, and it's for the I want things to seem real to the players idea, right? But like I said, you have the advantage, they're, play they're playing in your campaign, presumably. They're used to it being a medievalish fantasy world. So, like, elves or dwarfs will seem prosaic to them, which is good.
Okay, now, but I would say not to use, if you are if you have a bunch of guys brand new to role-playing gaming and it's not Call of Cthulhu, if it's D&D, I would say don't start them off with a horror scenario. Get them into the regular run of things first, and then go for something bad. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to build a horror scenario, and we're going to all do it together. And the first thing is, I think of things very... Uh, cinematically, I would say, I picture. I, I start off with a with an image. So, what I want first is a scene. Okay. Now, the scene could be from a movie. It could be a book. Could be from a comic or an anime. Could just a scene. It doesn't have to be even a, a horror related one. Like last year, they picked the Velveteen Rabbit. Okay. We made a great scenario out of that. So I want someone to quick like a bunny stick up their hand. <laughs> okay, give me a scene. Doesn't have to be horror related at all, but it could be. Sure. Uh, dock workers doing some late night fishing. Is that from a movie or a book or a... Oh. pre existing Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Pre-existing scene, so we have baggage. Got one in the back here. You feel me. I'll get you back to you. I'll back to you later. Tom Hanks waking up on the island in that one where he's Cast away. Yeah. Cast, cast away. away. Where he's a castaway. I should have been able to think of that. <laughs> okay, I'm a little disadvantaged because I haven't seen that movie. Okay? I, I only see like horrible, sleazy horror movies, like The Shrine and stuff. Um, but I know about Castaway. I know that he wakes up on the island. What happens when he wakes up? Just so I know. I, I've seen the scene where his plane blows up. He finds a bunch of junk that's been yeah. swept up from the FedEx plane. Yeah. He's stuck there. Oh, well, I know he's stuck there, but well, what does he do when he sees the junk? Is he crying? He is he like it. trying to collect it? He's yeah. immediately trying to survive. Yeah. He's, he's, he's robbing the Okay, that's fine. Okay, cast away. Got the scene. Excellent. Now... We want a location. Does not have to be connected to the scene. So like, don't pick Desert Island, okay? The location could be in a Zeppelin, at a lighthouse, on the moon, at like, I mean, I did say that don't do things on the moon for the thing, but whatever. There's a location that's odd, and I'm gonna pick you for a location. What's an exciting place? Last year it was a Hot spring spa in, in Iceland, but this will be fantasy, so probably not in Iceland. I was going to say Glacier National Park. Glaciers. Whoa. Glaciers and mountains. Okay. And now I'm going to call upon the girl who looks most like one of my granddaughters, <laughs> and you're going to give me a monster or an enemy. A giant bunny. A giant bunny. <laughs> Boy, that's going to be tough to turn into a scary monster. <laughs> um, I shouldn't have picked the girl who looked like my granddaughter. <laughs> just trying to be me. Okay. Now, this is what we're starting with. <laughs> yeah, that was so scary. Um, so the scariest part about Night Olympus was me was the fact that the scriptwriter thought that putting running an electric charge through a, um, a train tracks, the single most grounded thing in the entire universe would ever electrocute anybody, let alone a herd of giant rabbits. Like that guy knew nothing about electricity. I'm sure that guy's dead by now, killed by his own wiring, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> the electrical train tracks, you think that'll kill the bunnies. It's like, you can't, like, train tracks, like, you can't get more grounded than train tracks, you know? Can, can the giant bunny have, like, the Ebola virus or something? We are going to talk, we are, look, here's the thing. We're starting with this. Yeah. I didn't reject the bunny, you notice. You can do a lot with the bunny. The, but, but... Importantly, we don't have to end with the bunny because we can say, you know what? This scene is going more towards a giant weasel or something. We said, we, no, we, don't, have to, we, can, we don't have to, all of this could change. We just have to have a starting point to conjure with, to get our ideas. So we got a bunch of, we got a party of adventurers. Every game you have the issue of how do you get these guys to the place, 
okay? And boy, do we have a solution because we started with Castaway and we have to find some way that our players are cast away somewhere and they're stuck there and they have to figure out a way to get out. Okay, so let's consider this. And we're gonna work on it together. Uh, you have suggestions being up. So how can we cast away the players? We don't have airplanes. It's a fantasy world, yes sir. Uh, dimension door gone awry. Dimension door gone awry. Well, we could use that. I'm hoping there's something more prosaic if I can, but I'll use Dimension Door if I got it. A uh, shipping boat runs aground. A, sh a ship could run aground. Um, in fact, my new scenario coming up in uh, October, Ghoul Island uses that very concept where they have a shipwreck and they're cast upon the shore of an island. It's not a desert island, though it has like a city and stuff on it. How about um, settlers, and ghouls. settlers caught in a snowstorm or something? Yeah. Well, are your players settlers? Well, they're, they're it seems to, unlikely. They could be hired as guards. To, they could be hired as guards. Are your the kind of players that hire as guards? Just like a, a my guard, my players might be looting the caravan. Titanic analog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could be on a boat and it crashes. Some yeah. kind of avalanche traps them as they're traveling through the mountains. Mm, an avalanche sounds good because it means they're trapped. So we are. So we are. We are. So what stimulates your players to go somewhere in the game? And I'm gonna call on. On Mike. Uh, loot. <laughs> loot. So when you want your players to go to a place, you say, boy, there's a lot of money up there. <clears throat> uh, something heroic. Someone in need. A quest. Someone needs help. And we'll reward them for it. Hmm. Well, I kind of like the avalanche idea, though, because it traps them and it's connected to glaciers. So all we need to do is think of a reason, and you know your players better than I do, so maybe I won't go down this rabbit hole anymore. Ha, huh, got the bunny in, see? And what we're gonna do is, the players have to go across a mountain range. All right? Oh, yes, okay. But it's not a problem, because it's the middle of summer, so, you know, it's not an issue. We're gonna go across the mountain range, and on the other side of the mountain range, there is something desirable and i don't care what it is because the something desirable is what they're going to have in the next adventure after this one they think they're going to the golden city now or the or the fountain of youth or or to inherit the dukedom or whatever but they're really not they're really just going to get caught by the avalanche so screw those guys right so they so and in and, and the, and the big picture they might eventually think that this is just a step on the way the bigger picture and maybe it will be it doesn't matter because horror scenarios also have the feature that the 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 shorter and like punchier they are like usually the better like let's let's face it stephen king's best novels aren't his thousand page tomes right it's the little ones like the girl who liked tom uh the baseball guy i can't think of it or christine or like the short like lovecraft mostly just just wrote uh is tom bradley is that the guy yeah, it's, I mean, Lovecraft wrote mostly short stories. His longest story was 130 pages. That was like, you know, so because it's hard to hold terror over a long period. You know, that's why horror shorts, you know, are often better than horror movies, you know, horror shorts, right? So, so having a short horror thing, then they go back and then they inherit the dukedom or whatever, it's fine. So we're gonna have them go across the mountains and I'm gonna have it set up because it's good to surprise them in the middle of summer. We're gonna go across the mountains. There's too many of you to use the Pegasus Express because they cost a fortune. Those guys really gouge you. So we're just gonna walk across the mountains. Not gonna be a problem. Maybe they're escorting the caravan and maybe they're even, maybe even, even like, well, you can escort the caravan because that way you could, that has two advantages. One is it lets them think they're kind of double dipping. They're being paid as guards. Plus they get to go across. Maybe it's their caravan. They're gonna sell all the loot on the other side because no one there has whatever you're carrying across that's useful. And I have a, a stole of things in my mind always as, as useful things that people would want to buy that is totally not functional for players and adventurers. As an example, transparent wood. I have a place in my world where there's, a trans, where there's trees that are transparent. And you can think of how great that would be to have chunks of wood that are transparent, use them for windows or anything, it's really great. But they're not really very useful for players to fight monsters. So I can give them this amazing magic thing that's only good for selling and that they, that they don't feel cheated by, you know? So that's an example of a kind of thing I would, I would do. 
Uh, rocks that glow brightly in the dark are useful, but not so much on adventures anyway. So they have their, their caravan, and the caravan has a function not only that they can think they can double dip and get there, but also that um, if one of them gets killed, because it is a horror scenario after all, that there's replacement characters on that caravan for them. Okay? Plus, <laughs> you can pull someone out of the caravan to be a bad guy for them. So, uh, so they are in the mountains, and they're getting way high, and up there, and now I'm thinking, um, oh, what's the name of the mountain in the Lord of the Rings that you can't cross? Not in the Misty Mountains. You know, they're trying to get, they have to go through Moria instead because it was so hard to go across the mountain. It's the Misty Mountains. It is the Misty Mountains, but that specific mountain had a name. Uh, it wasn't Moria. Moria is the dungeons. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's Lord of the Rings seeing it going across the mountain, it's really hard to get. So, but the notice that suddenly it gets harder when it shouldn't be. So that's what's gonna happen. It's gonna like, it's a snowstorm in July. Snowstorm, we gotta hold up. We're holding up, it keeps getting colder, and there is an avalanche. And I'm gonna, we're gonna play off this ice somehow into the, into the horror. So now they're stranded in the mountains. Scene one, stranded in the mountains. I mean, there's things before it, right? Mm -hmm. They're cut off and there's an avalanche and something's wrong because like, there shouldn't be an avalanche in July in the mountains, right? That's like, because I don't think they were planning to go that high, but there is. So they got an avalanche and they're cut off and, and another advantage of the, uh, the caravan idea is the avalanche can be tumbling down and knocking their carts over and killing their animals, maybe killing some people and everything's all terrifying. And it's a kind of a prosaic enemy. They weren't attacked by a bunch of flying goblins, right? It's, it's an avalanche. And we talked earlier, you guys weren't here, but we talked about having the horror being prosaic makes it punch home to the characters more. So in a fantasy world, you don't want to use like really exotic things all the time. You want to have it be like something that seems like real world. So they're, so the, and uh, so they're, they, they're, they're cracked in the mountains, trapped on the island, it's cold, we got the glacier thing, and now how can we get out of this fix? We don't, I mean, the food truck was, was knocked down by the glaciers, you know? If you wanna have interesting things, you can either have the, the struggles be a lot of role, like adventures and skill roles trying to get out of the avalanche, save things. You could have monsters in the avalanche, you know, as well for them to battle, you know, polar bears or whatever you have in your mountains. Um, you can you use your own judgment of what kind of ice monsters make the most sense. It wouldn't have to be too tough, just something to kind of give them something to worry about a little bit more. So they eventually, they overcome the problems, they rescue things, okay, we don't have food, the avalanche is here, the storm's still blowing, and having a storm is good because it's cold, that's feeling, it's windy and blowing, that's sound, and you can't see a thing and not seeing a thing is still sight. So you got three senses, you're constantly going with them. And you can do things like, oh, you walk so far, start, your fingers start getting numb. You're like, you know, and, and then they like, start freaking out that they might have, maybe some of them can get a little bit of frostbite. You don't care if one of your players loses a toe, right? Or a little bit of an ear, hey, you can survive that. There's a reroll in spell somewhere. Um, not, maybe not in the mountains, but somewhere. Um, and if they brought something really important to save their asses, then that can be destroyed in the avalanche too. You know, like like the cleric with the resurrect spell. Ah, he, he bought it, you know, too bad. So, so we got him set in the mountains. And so now they are in Castaway. They're going through the stuff. What do we have left? Okay, and this is a really fun interactive thing for the players, because I've done something like this before, which is like, as they start thinking of things they might have, you're like, oh yeah, you can find that. And they'll think of things that they might have that you didn't think of. Do we have, do we have a tarp? You know, can we set up a tent? And you go, sure, sure. And then they'll feel, they'll feel rewarded for their cleverness and thinking of making a, a shelter out of the tarp. They'll feel rewarded for saying, we can break up the broken wagon for firewood so we can be warm because there's no trees in this place. And, and you know, and they'll, and the players love feeling smart, okay? <clears throat> And you always want the players to blame something terrible on themselves not thinking of it, not on you for being a mean GM. And since you just were like a super mean GM by avalanche, you know, you need to make sure that they, and also for that matter, during the avalanche, while they're doing things, or fighting the polar bears, or trying to rescue the horses, making strength rolls, or, or, whatever, or, or call them horse, animal rolls, or whatever, then you want to make sure that they feel like they've done things successfully to mitigate the disaster. 
the disaster is still big, but like, oh man, if you hadn't made those rolls, you know, you would have lost two more wagons. And they go, oh, yeah, I saved the day. You know, and, right? So there it is. Stranded in the mountains, castaway scene, trying to find the stuff. We got to get it together. We got to do our thing. And now, now what? Well, they can't go back. They can't go forward. They have to go around. And here is where, now I got the glaciers coming up because obviously what they have to do is go up and go across the glacier, I think, because that puts them actually on the glacier. And glaciers are really great places for a horror scenario because all your players have seen the thing. <coughs> By John Carpenter, and there's these crevices that go down 100 yards, and maybe she hasn't seen it, but it's scary. Uh, your dad might let you see the uh, the original Howard Hawks thing from the 50s, which is also really good actually, and and focuses on the cold, although it's in the Arctic instead of the Antarctic. But who cares? And it doesn't have Kurt Russell, but you know what the heck. It does have Chuck Connors. He plays the monster. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty scary. Everything outside, he's trying to destroy the heating units, you know, and he's not hurt by the cold. Unlike the thing in Carpenters, this thing doesn't care about the cold, uh, if you've ever seen it. So we have Stranded in the Mountains, we have the glaciers, they gotta get up and go across the glaciers, and glaciers are inherently scary because glaciers make noises. They groan, they creak, they're creepy, you know, and, there's, and, and you can't see the crevice right in front of you, and sometimes there's snow covering it. You walk up and there's two inches of snow, and you fall 100 feet into the bottom of the glacier, and how are they ever gonna get you out? Well, maybe they have a levitate spell, but maybe they don't. They can't see you. They cast it on you. So it's really scary. And there's probably something bad in the glaciers. And I would say that the percent chance of this is 100 because you're doing this now. There's going to be something really bad in the glaciers. And I'm getting all this. I didn't come up with these scenes, right? You guys did these, but it's working out as I start putting together. Now, at this point, we're like, what can the things be? What are we going to get them with? And I'm thinking, what I want, I actually was about to discard the giant bunny idea. But then I realized I don't have to because what we're doing is we're building up towards the, towards the bad reveal. It's always good to have a little mystery for the monster in a horror scenario. You can say you must kill the dragon to rescue the princess in a non-horror scenario. In a horror one, it's good to not know what it is for a while and then like, Oh my gosh, it's so horrible. It's so awful. So what we're going to do is we're going to be on the glacier. They're going to be starving, right? No food. There's only ice to eat. And like um, uh, uh, snow fleas, um, which are a real thing, but really you wouldn't eat them. They're like this big and they're black. Um, <clears throat> so here's where the giant bunnies are going to come in because I just thought of an idea. And the way the giant bunnies can actually be scary. You didn't think I could do it, could you? And here's how. They're on the glacier or nearby it, and you have not giant bunnies, you have big bunnies like this, okay, that the players can hunt and eat and get food. But at some point, they're going to say, how are the rabbits this big? And then, then that's when they see the two-foot centipede, okay, or, or, or a crow fly by the size of an eagle or something else enlarged. Because I'm thinking the enlarged idea is what we're going to go over here. And the bunnies will just be good at first. And you guys heard of the giant bunnies in these misty mountains? They go, no, I never heard of giant bunnies before. Something's enlarging things. And that's inherently creepy. Maybe not quite as creepy in uh, a fantasy world as in Call of Cthulhu, but still, it's got its moment, especially as things have been prosaic up now. The bunnies are big, yay, <laughs> you know? Um, the, 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 the snow fleas are big, that's not quite as yay, you know? The ravens are big, that's even less yay. It's, it's carried off the bunny's head, you know? And then like, what else is big up here? And how much bigger do they get? So, that, so right now you have things that are enlarging. And, not, and I'm guessing, and what I'm saying is that my suggestion is that this is not like a species of giant bunnies. It's bunnies that are being enlarged. So occasionally they might even see a bunny the size of a Vita bug or something off in the distance. And they go, oh, something's getting really big. Well, what's going on here? Okay. And, I got, and now I'm thinking about this growth thing, <coughs> thanks to her suggestion. So let's work on what we can do with the growth to make it scarier. 
And I'm just talking to myself um, because this is, again, I, I talk this out in my head when I'm doing this scenario. Thinking growth, how is growth scary? Well, the obvious prosaic way for growth to be scary is that there is there's something big that you don't want to be big, you know, like a cockroach. But there's another way to make growth scary, and it's a more horror-oriented way. And that's when the player wakes up and he's too big for his armor. Because <laughs> they're being affected by it. They're not going to like that, right? Some of them might say, oh, cool, I'm not a dwarf anymore. But, <laughs> but in general, they're going to go, what's happening? Okay. Um, something else you could also do, is so you could have some, what I'm saying is it could be forced to growing things. Then it's like going further than that, I'm saying, it'd be cool to make it worse than just growing. What if as it grew, something else was happening? So it starts out being bit, the big bunny, then it gets a bigger bunny. But what if as they get bigger, there's something else? They, instead of fur, they start, you start seeing scales on them. They get more squamous or chitin. What do we, what, what do we want to go with this? I'm thinking there's something that's growing everything towards its desired thing. Is it insect? Is it reptile? Is it ghostly? What is it? I'm asking you. Tumors. Tumors? Anyone else like tumors? <laughs> Who votes for tumors? <laughs> Who votes against tumors? Okay, tumors have the day. Okay, they're starting to grow tumors. Lumps are appearing around. And so, and this, and once, if they've seen some of the tumors, they've lived for a while out there, maybe they fought some big animals, like, like, a, like a big mink, you know, or an ermine, I guess it would be in the snow. You know, maybe, maybe an arctic wolf that's, that's the size of a horse or something. They've had some cool fights. They're getting across the glaciers. They're avoiding the chasms. They're making skill rolls. Because not everything has to be a fight to get across the chasms. Maybe they had a rescue guy to crack. And then they start, they, as things get bigger, they start having these gross tumors. So like the giant wolf is like tumorous and disease, eyes poking out of its head, and it's got like a thing on a canker sore on its lips. And then when the, that, that means that when the player wakes up and he's too big for his britches, he's going to be really freaked out. He's not just going to say, oh, great, I get an extra point of size. He's going to like, uh-oh, where is this going? You know, and, and, he's gonna, and they're gonna have two questions. They're gonna have, the first question is, most important is like, if I can get out of the mountains, will it stop? And there's, I mean, there's no guarantee that it would, right? I mean, that's up to you, the game master. But I wouldn't have stopped, I would I have it triggered, right? Another question, is, and the other question is like, what is going on, what's doing this? So, we have a need for another villain. We've got giant bunnies taken care of, and they're doing something that's really creepy and scary to the players, right? Giant bunnies, who would've thought it? What's doing this? What's behind it? It doesn't have to be sentient. I mean, it could be the easy lame answer is it's a demon lord doing that. And that's not necessarily a bad answer. Sometimes the easy lame answer works out fine. Okay? But, yeah, right. yeah. but it could be a curse or it could be a what? They just they ate the bunnies and they caught it. Oh. The Matongo fungus of terror answer. Which you haven't seen, Matongo Fungus of Terror. <laughs> Great 60s Japanese horror sci-fi film. Almost as good as Goke. Paras uh, um, uh, Parasite from Hell. Which, how great is that name? Um, But the thing is, if it's contagious, something's spreading the contagion. What has happened to make this a thing even? And how are the bunnies getting it? They don't eat bunnies. Could be, uh, what was the anthology with Stephen King? Um, but it was a meteorite that uh, Oh, the meteor, yeah, yeah, from Creepshow. Meteor shit. Yeah, Creepshow, yeah. Creep show, yeah. Creep show did it too. Yeah. Could be a meteor, yeah. Could be like a carnivorous plant or something. It wants to like, get them big, so when they eat them, it's... When, the carnivorous plant wants to eat the big things? Yeah. What about the heart of a demon? It's just got shattered out. There's some left there. And it's, it's corrupting the, the environment. Maybe exposed after the avalanche? Crevices. Oh, yeah. Crevices. Well, no, the avalanche, remember the, the cold, we have the cold, that's right, we have the cold to deal with. The cold came, the unnatural cold came first. So if you want to discard the unnatural cold, 
We can do it. We can say, we have to get across in the winter. It's going to be tough, but we're going to do it. And then the avalanche is natural. But the, but the giant bunnies still aren't. Do we want to do that? Or do we want to make them go in the summer and have the, uh, try to cook up cold with the mutation somehow? Who votes for... for uh, if, the thing is, if you have too many different moving parts, mm -hmm. it becomes harder to control. Mm -hmm. so, so all in favor of having the, the unnatural cold be unnatural, raise your hand. Okay, and all in favor of the unnatural cold actually just being during the winter? Uh, I guess we have more people going that way. Okay, so, but that, but those of you that like the unnatural cold, gotta keep it, right? So they're going across during the winter, it's cold. The, this means the avalanche could have exposed something. And that could have been what started it, which is why the bunnies are small at first. And also it's useful because they go through the adventure, things keep getting worse and worse. The bunnies or whatever it keeps getting bigger, the, the mink keep getting bigger, the wolves, and they get more and more diseased and horrible until at some point they're seeing big dead, like huge animals with like lumps. They can't even, I don't know what they are anymore, just masses of tumors. And these tumors, I might have played too much Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> But I think that the tumors spawn something eventually. It's like it's implanted things in them. It's growing them. This is right from the Lovecraft story of the Colorado Space, where it's growing them. So it's growing them, and that's going to make the players really excited that they're getting bigger. <laughs> okay, it's it's growing new things, and what, and and something's going to come out of these tumors. Obviously. And this is gonna they're gonna start seeing these things, okay, that were exposed by the avalanche from a meteor or a shattered demon's heart or an extra dimensional gate or the mountain god who is now insane because no one's worshipped him for a million billion years because no one wants to live in the damn mountains. Um, and this is what has caused these things and there and so well we have a third monster sort of. And the question is what is what comes out of those those spawning pods that they think they thought were tumors? Yes. Someone mentioned uh, plants earlier. Plants. I think that plants that's are a coming really out. Cool idea. Yes, yes. And uh, plants seem odd for the ice. So I'm thinking these plants have to be odd. So I'm thinking if they're like blue or odd colored, so carnivorous plants. Oh, that do spores. Or seeds, and that's what they're planting in the animals in the first place, and they get bigger. But you can also eat a seed, just like you can eat an animal that has um, tapeworm cysts in it, which don't do that, and then you get tapeworms. Okay, the life cycle. In fact, in fact, just make it easy for those of you who did not have a, uh, a sort of biological education like me. You got this? Can I raise some of this? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason I'm doing this is because knowing the life cycle is going to help you know what should happen during the adventure. So here's what the life cycle of a tapeworm is. That this is a kind of reverse plant, I understand, but it has a life cycle. It means I have the tapeworm one because tapeworm one is kind of interesting. So here we have tapeworm. Now in our case, it's probably living outside the plant on its own doing things, eating stuff and things, right? But it fires its cysts into things. Now in real life, what it does is it lays eggs and you crack them out. And then something touches the eggs, hits the eggs, eats, eats grass that, the, that, that your poop was touching, and ingests the eggs. The eggs evert little heads burrow through the wall of the intestines or stomach, go into the bloodstream, travel throughout the animal's body. Let's take an example of the beef tapeworm. <clears throat> you're, in the, you're, in the, you're out in the field taking care of your cows and you have the call of nature, so you, you take care of it. Not thinking about it. The cow later on comes and eats a piece of grass that has an egg on it, okay? Because you've got, whatever, it doesn't have to, it's not eating the poop, it's just like there's some egg on it. You know, it's, so now, now in the cow's bloodstream, there's tapeworm cysts. They travel all through the bloodstream until they lodge somewhere and they go into the muscle and they burrow in and they form a cyst. And the cysts are about the size of a bee. Okay? And they used to call this measly beef. If you caught up on a piece of beef and you had little pale dots in it, that was measly beef, meant there was tapeworms in it. So cook it is what they would do because like you couldn't afford throwing beef. Now, you know, like 
the FDA would not put a stamp on approval. You wouldn't even get it, right? But so the cysts are in the meat. Then you, who quite properly only eat rare steak, eat the measly beef, and you swallow a cyst. What's your name? Gage. 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 So Gage has cysts in his stomach now. Okay? The cyst now everts its head, hooks onto the wall of his small intestine, and starts growing segments and becomes a full tapeworm. And then when next time he's out in the field and he has a call of nature, the whole thing starts again. This is the cycle. Simple and straightforward. Go through so there's a so there's a host and there's a target thing. So you are the target thing because you ate the rabbits. The rabbits are a host, okay? What it's trying to do is get into you or into a carnivore. And here's why I think, because it needs an intelligent host for its ultimate form. So it can be as smart as possible. So it just wants the rabbits or, or dumb things like that or centipedes just enough to be eaten by something else. So the cysts might slow them down so the wolves can catch them, right? And, then the wolf, and a wolf is smarter than a rabbit, so like you're better off there. And a human, wow, it loves having a human, because obviously when it bursts out of your head, it's got your brain power. And once these things reach full sapience, which they haven't been before, they've only had to be wolves and mink and stuff, you know? Now it can be human level intelligence. Now the world is threatened, and we have this cool plant. And I'm thinking that a weird blue plant that feeds off your brain and, and has a life cycle, it's got to come from outer space or from another dimension. So I think that the avalanche exposed a meteor or a thing. And one of the cool things about having be a, a meteor or a gate that's exposed is that it could have been there centuries ago, so there can be legends of it that someone can vaguely remember that are disorder from the last time this happened, when like all life on the northern continent was wiped out or whatever terrible thing resulted from it. Um, let's see, one last thing. Okay, we got time for the one last thing. We got five minutes. I've got another image in my head for this thing to complete this life cycle. Okay, which is, how did it get to your planet? And I got an idea for this based on a plant from space because I'm, I, I riff on it. And I'm just, remember, I'm just, I'm just using your ideas, which you will do the same when you're doing it. Now, I'm doing this whole thing, I'm doing most of the talking, and it's all taking place in about 30 minutes that we're doing it. And we're, and we're ending up with what I think is a pretty killer scenario for the players, okay? Now, normally I could take a lot more time to do it, and I wouldn't have to, right? So you, you may, you may, be, you may or may not think like, I'm not sure I can think as fast as Sandy on his feet. You don't have to think as fast as Sandy. You can sit down and take it a few hours, and you're gonna come up with stuff better than mine in a half an hour, okay? But here's what, but again, I, I think in terms of movie cinema, has anyone seen the movie? Gamma vs. Legion. Yeah. Okay, so in Gamma vs. Legion, these creatures come from outer space. I don't know about the creatures. What I worry about is that, is that their reproductive cycle is they build a giant flower. Okay. And this flower like fills all the air around it with extra oxygen, tons of oxygen, to the point that when you light a cigarette lighter, it goes whoop into the air, okay? And all the oxygen, then it opens up, and then it triggers an explosion, which is like nuclear-sized explosion, and it fires the giant seed off into space. And so in the movie, the reason you have to stop these things is because the creatures are actually attracted by electromagnetic waves, so they're setting up, they aren't even intelligent. They're setting up their giant flowers in cities. <laughs> Each city's got nukes in them by these monsters. So if we have these things, the ultimate goal is to set up the giant flowers and fire back over the space. So if the players fail or don't stop at first, they have to go back and find their way back home and get up an army. When they go back up, they can have the giant monster flower getting ready to erupt and blow up the mountains. That's kind of an exciting, cool guy. And you could even have a whole adventure where they're going inside the flowers, caverns and things, right? And meeting cre the, the explorer creatures there, the animals' tendrils, the little sub animals, the parasites that live on the plant. What, right? We haven't even gotten to that part. We don't have time to go do into that part, but what a great adventure that would be. And that's all part of the same adventure, right? Where they've gone up there, they found this terrifying thing. If, if they can escape 
and save themselves. Maybe they can purge themselves of the giant slime thing. Maybe they can't, but they can get back. They fight the giant flower. They have an adventure inside the giant flower. It's full of monsters. And then all of this is just a lead into that adventure, remember, a long time ago when they're going to cross the mountains and go and get the Dukem. And there we have a horror scenario, which I think is pretty good, that we really made together, OK? And that we put together. I spent the first 15 minutes talking about how to make your horror things better. Then there's only half an hour to do this scenario. And you could take longer, or I usually take longer, actually, myself. Mike, you're reading, waving your hand. Yeah, question. So I find with fantasy, uh, horror is usually screwed up by magic for players. It can be. And so how do you get around that? It's not a problem. In this one, so I have a guy with magic. So I'm going to fireball the giant rabbit. No problem. Plenty more where it came from. Fireball the giant wolf. Not a problem. Hold monster giant wolf. Eventually, these things are starting to come out anyway. How, what spell is there that will stop you from being... Um, growing. Greater restoration. It's not really what? Greater restoration. Greater what? Does that cure disease? Yeah. It's not really disease though. Yeah. It's like a pituitary gland malfunction, right? And what's the story? You can see that maybe that would work, maybe, maybe it wouldn't. It's up to you. You can say, well, you know, okay, it works. And then, like, you're no longer growing. The tumor stays where it is. Or you can have us happen again. Remember, the, he still has to eat rapid swings up there. Eventually, things are going to run, run dry on him. And uh, the monster itself from outer space may follow different natural laws. But the thing is, the point is that it's not one single guy that you can go to and drive a stake through his heart and you're saved. It's these plants that the seeds are all over, and there's hundreds of them. And even if you manage to get rid of every single seed in the party, there's wolves and there's Sherpas and there's people up there in the hills that are all being affected. And there's thousands of these things coming. What are we going to do? We have a war against them? And if, we, if you fight them, then the people that are fighting them are going to get infected. You're going to have even more of it. And at some point, it's beyond the point where you can cast 10,000 greater frustrations and save the day, right? And so eventually, it all boils down to the dungeon crawl through the giant plant with the plant monsters and parasites and giant aphids. Hey, remember we were talking about aphids before the getting started? <laughs> the killer aphids. There you go, because what this plant has aphids, right? So that's our adventure. I hope uh, you found things in there. If you don't want to use this adventure, you'll find elements of it and the way we developed that will work. And the key things are, I use, a I use a scene from a movie or a book that I like. I don't have to like the movie. I don't have to like the book. I have to like the scene. So I've gotten good scenes from movies that were terrible <laughs> just because that scene was good. And if I have time, I will tell you, which I don't. So <laughs> okay. any questions before we bail? It has been a pleasure. Uh, I, I hope it's been educational and useful. It, is, it was intended to kind of be a practicum to learn how to do the, the thing the right way. And now you'll see how I've done it. Thank you.